Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by Betty Carville to talk all about the final season of Netflix's series, The Crown. Um, and I wanted to start by talking a little bit about kind of how you started approaching this role, because um, I loved hearing you describe that you really enjoy the scope when you're playing a real character of how much to do and how much not to do, because obviously you can never fully become that person. There's always going to be slight differences. Um, and so for playing Tony Blair in the series, how did you figure out the intricacies of where do I want to directly capture certain things to do with speech or mannerisms or charisma? And where do I feel like I want to create that freedom of space for myself? Because The Crown very much exists in that middle space as a show to begin with. Um, it's a really good question. I mean, I didn't, I, I guess, um, in an ideal world, you'd, um, uh, both nail the mannerisms and verisimilitude in every frame and feel free to, um, uh, I mean, it's key to feel free as a, as an actor and as an artist, you have to kind of create a sense of freedom. Otherwise it's going to be stilted and wooden, I would say, but, um, in an ideal world, everybody would marvel at every every utterance and say, yeah, that's him. But I think the way that you you get that belief from people is, is not to pin yourself to it. It has to be um, um, marveled at in every utterance. You just want a few key moments. So I looked at, uh, there's a lot of bits in the show where uh, we recreate verbatim speeches. And it seemed obvious to me that in those sequences, I should um, do my homework and make sure I could draw as much from that footage as possible. Um, but that wasn't just about copying it because, you know, the camera angles we use aren't the same camera angles and the sets aren't the same sets and the costumes aren't necessarily the same costumes. It's all in, you know, it's lots of different people looking at the same footage and, and being inspired by it. So really I found like it was a um, looking at footage of scenes I knew we were going to shoot, speeches I knew he'd had made, doing the work on um, trying to kind of copy the cadence and rhythm in particular and tune, um, but doing that as much as anything else as a way of trying to get inside. Uh, there's a kind of outside in method um, of acting saying, well, if I say it, in the same way he said it, what does that feel like on the inside? Rather than kind of going inside out and saying, well, what do I need to feel here? And then how does it come out? Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So um, I guess, and I guess, you know, I I am often quite an outside in sort of an actor in terms of like my first approach to roles will often be to think about, um, uh, Crude, crude elements like what what am I going to look like? Um, I find that libera I find that a source of freedom, where other actors would feel pinned in if they had to walk in a certain way. Or I actually find that that gets me off my centre and allows me to start to feel like somebody else, and I, and I I become less self conscious and more free, and that tends to improve the work. I think, although as I've got older. I realize that it doesn't matter where you come in, outside in, inside out. Um, it, it actually doesn't matter. And that the, the real barometer of whether it feels free and truthful is, is always on the inside. If that makes any sense, I hope it does. Yeah, it all makes all makes absolute sense. And, you know, with with what you were describing as well, in terms of the scenes in the show where you're creating speeches or moments verbatim, and that footage is out there online, you know, people can look up certain speeches and, and kind of look at it side by side with your performance. How would you kind of approach the meticulousness of really studying it? Because you're really capturing the cadence, the pacing. Okay, here's where I need to pause for a second. Here's what the tone of delivery is. And even just the physical gestures to such a specific degree for moments like that versus the behind closed doors scenes. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, you know, it didn't feel like I had to copy that there was no, nobody on set um saying oh you didn't catch that I, I did that work completely in private so and and really it's a sense of like take what's useful and throw the rest away so i um i have quite a strong 
ear. I think I have quite a, a sort of musical ear. I tend to learn my lines by listening to them anyway, because I've learned over the years that, well, two things. One is that if you're listening to your lines, your eyes are free to think, to see stuff. And, uh, and also, I, I, I guess I just have a brain that's wired that way. So anyway, I listen to my lines. But, you know, if I was doing a scene that was based on a verbatim speech, I might listen to that speech over and over and over again. And yes, I'd watch it as well. And yes, I might notice some mannerisms, but I'd let it go in at a very sort of subliminal level. I'm not kind of going frame by frame and going, you know, on this word, I have to use the because I want that to come from inside and from my body. So I've kind of, you know, I've, I've looked enough. I've played quite a few characters based on real people you know i played donald trump quite recently and you know watched hours and hours of footage before i even knew i was going to be playing him um as many of us did and um so you've got a sort of you've got a you've got a, a subliminal layer of information where you know you know what it what you're moving towards and then as you're learning it and practicing it in in your bedroom or you know driving to the supermarket whatever it's just sort of um starting to sit inside your own body rather than be outside of you and then on the day I, I i mean i i just i came out with whatever my body did in the take because i've already got the musical rhythm of it in my brain and moreover not just how it should sound and when i go up on what line but what i think why i think he's making the key thing here is listen to the tape of tony blair talking at the chicago economic forum for example Watch it, watch it, watch it, listen to it, listen to it, listen to it. Start to say the lines, start to marry those two things and start to work out why he's speaking in that way. And I don't know, and you know, he probably can't remember why, or maybe he can. Some of it's rhetorical, it's very clever rhetoric, but some of it, you know, little stumbles and things. I start to invent thoughts that are behind that. And that that's my performance. That's not me copying the real person, it's me starting to live inside that character it's the same actually if you're not playing you know a scene that's completely completely fictional a fictional character or or in this show one of the fictional scenes your job as an actor is when you say the lines that that is as fully lived in it has as many things crowding into your brain and into your spirit as when you do stuff in like I'm making this interview up as we go a lot, you know, I'm just thinking of things to say, but a lot of different things, you know, I'm a, a little bit self-conscious, a little bit in love with the sound of my own voice. I've got something to say. I'm looking at you. I'm responding to your smile. All of those things have to be going on in a fictional scene. And the danger is that if you've practiced too hard doing it in a set way, it sort of, it deadens everything. So I feel like often the, the trick on camera is to be really well prepared so that you can then just be free to, and whatever comes out, comes out. And that's when it starts to kind of really come alive. So that's a very long winded answer. <laughs> I mean, I, I love all of those details in, and kind of going back to what you were talking about in terms of how you work with the script and listening to it. Um, I also wanted to ask about the detail, particularly for, for this and, and playing Blair, with how you found the cadence and the rhythm of his speech and, and you found a usefulness in kind of almost writing out the dialogue differently specifically to that rhythm. And I was just interested in how you really found that for yourself and if this is the first time that you've utilized that tool specifically. Um, no, I mean, the boring answer is I'm not sure I ever have done it before and it just occurred to me one day and, and I tried it and, you know, I don't know if it was useful or not. I definitely noticed that he has a particular cadence. The interesting thing to me was that in between, you know, so there's this kind of staccato rhythm, often he'll interrupt his own thoughts halfway through. And I think two things about that. One is it makes for those thoughts to be much more easily digested because he's giving people time to hear the, the thing and then, you know, respond. And so that's kind of clever in a way but I also, it occurred to me, he's also thinking, that's his thinking time. And so um, part of the fun with a role like that is, you know, here's this expert communicator, but who's also having to think at a thousand miles an hour. 
about how to run this room with this very high status individual in the case of the queen, you know, and to have those moments where he's just thinking about what the next part of the sentence might be was just fun for me. And it seemed to um, line up with what he does. So I should learn from him and take more pauses and breaths in my sentences. They tend to be incredibly long clauses with um, uh, semicolons in that don't necessarily go anywhere. So <laughs> good luck editing this. I mean, also in terms of thinking about the meetings that he has with the Queen and the way that we see those, they're, you know, they're kind of throughout the series at these different moments. And when you step back and look at the scope of time that passes between them, we get to see him kind of almost first stepping into that room and kind of finding his level of comfort. What does that communication look like between the two of them? to a point where he starts to feel more comfortable within himself and to have more of a sense of, you know, what is it, what is it going to look like when I walk into the room and sit down with her and have a conversation and, and what are we going to discuss today? Um, and so how did you want to kind of like create that arc of, of how it feels quite different towards the end of the series versus earlier on with the two of them? Uh, I don't know that that was deliberate. That might be because we shot, I mean, we don't ever shoot in order, but you shoot blocks in order. So the, the, you know, the earlier episodes were shot before the later episodes. So maybe to do with my finding my confidence with that crew and with the role, if I'm entirely honest, you know, like <coughs> the stuff I did at the end of season five, I did very soon after being cast and we hadn't had much time to, you know, I hadn't had really hardly any time to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a wig in season five, whereas I'm not wearing a wig in season six for example. Um, uh, so my confidence that I am convincing to myself grew over that period of time. And maybe that's what you're seeing. Um, if anything, I think the opposite is true. Right? The, the, the note I did give myself was that these scenes are not the feature of Tony Blair's day. Uh, he's running the country a country that is at war for much of that story, you know, some of that story one in one place of the world or another, there's going to be a million different crises. He's got prime minister's questions later that morning sort of thing. So actually I tried to walk into the room like, yes, this is an incredibly important meeting now, but one of my favorite scenes is where he's kept waiting for the little red light to go off. And, you know, like you feel like, come on <laughs> yes this is a very important room to be walking into but really like um, there's 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 important stuff going on out there so I tried not to to do that so any any unease you're seeing may well be Bertie failing to hide his <laughs> uh his uh sense of being daunted by walking onto a film set I mean it's always daunting to walk onto a film set the the more um and actually playing a high status character who is n not necessarily the highest status character on a film set. Well, certainly in this show, you know, I'm way down the call sheet number, I think it was number 15. So not so far down, but you're coming in and there's all these kind of movie stars around you and they've all been doing it for years and years and years. It's quite difficult actually, because however confident one is that, you know, I've been around the block a few times, I've been doing this 20 years or whatever it's still quite daunting and there's completely new crew and they don't know you're not going to be the one to fuck it up. Like, um, so that's probably what you're seeing behind my eyes rather than any deliberate choice. <laughs> what I did want to do as the season went on was give a sense of aging. And I didn't, when, when we set out um, on the journey and I started working with Kate Hall, the uh, hair and makeup designer and Amy Roberts, the costume designer, None of us knew what Peter was going to write for season six. So I was really hoping that there would be an arc there. And we designed three different kind of looks, which are very subtly different, but which um, I, I think are, are really effective in a very subtle way and which we used to just give the sense that, again, you know, we're not making... I'm I'm afraid the um, uh, ten ten hour biopic of Tony Blair's life or time in government, but the sense that 
that story is going on in between my scenes, I, I thought was really, really delicately done. And um, I really enjoyed working with those creative people. Um, yeah. I like the name of your show, by the way, because the best thing about being an actor is being in creative company. And, you know, I'm, I'm out here in Belfast directing something actually, and it's just the best job in the world to, to spend your day with other creative artists, all thinking from different angles about different problems and problem solving techniques. And to spend your time steeped in creativity is just, I mean, if somebody could have told me at school, you could do that for a living, I just wouldn't have believed them. It's amazing, it's amazing. It's a great place to be. I love that, I really, really appreciate hearing that as well. And thanks for the shout out on the name too. <laughs> It's great. It's a great name. I mean, also in terms of what you were describing just now about the the aging and all of the moments that are existing whilst he's prime minister that we don't get to see in the show, the show really covers this this great scope of time from when he was first elected and it was this real air of, you know, hopefulness and, you know, he felt quite modern for politics at the time. Um, and it felt like someone who could move the needle forward to then when you look at the disappointment and the way that people felt so let down by him and the animosity that was exerted towards him, which the series captures in some of those scenes. And so for you, what were kind of like the consistencies or changes that you felt in him playing him from going from being at the height of his popularity to a place where he's being quite publicly reviled in his career? Um, there's a great moment uh, where the Queen kind of... I don't know that she challenges him, but um, uh, scores a point about Iraq. And you see the surprise that she's gone there in that way. And, and, and in that moment, you know, like one of the things I was reminded of when I was doing my research and I lived through that, this period and uh, I sort of, but going back and looking at stuff again, one of the things that I was reminded of was this sense of a man who's sort of got a sense of humour and that even though he's facing, you know, you could do a whole f film on the, the darkness that I'm sure was in uh, facing that public criticism and vitriol. But I thought, well, something I've, I've slightly forgotten is the guy who kind of slightly laughs at himself and I wanted to keep that in so that even though you're seeing somebody age visibly I mean one of the things I, I do remember was how he as so many prime ministers do aged visibly during that period of office I mean it was a long period but you know the the, the cares of the world weigh down on a prime minister especially if you're in power for that long and so we, you know, doing that with hair and makeup and with my sense of how I'm, uh, how the flame is burning inside me and, and the amount of other stuff. So as the episodes are going on, that what I was just talking about, about the sense that this is not the most important thing in his day necessarily. There are other really big things. And I wanted that, let that, that red box of things that I'm carrying into the room, the other things that I'm having to manage to get heavier and heavier. But I also wanted him always to be somebody who was gonna try and find a lightness. So that in that moment where she kind of takes the knife out and says, will you be, will you be telling yourself that over Iraq? And, and he's kind of slightly winded, but also kind of amused. I, I was something I remember. Look, it's a long time ago that we actually shot this, so you're asking me to remember why my preparation for something I did a long time ago. But yeah, does that answer the question? It does, and and when you were talking about the the sense of humor and and the ability to kind of laugh at himself as well, it was making me think about the scene where it's him and Shuri at home, and he's just gotten off the phone with Bill Clinton, and yeah. it's him impersonating. You're allowed to do the acting. Yeah, yeah. 
them are doing it. And so it says a lot about their relationship that A, you know, she's very much a counsel and someone that he sees as equal in their partnership and someone that he can discuss foreign policy with, but also just that sense of humor that they shared with one another. Um, and yeah. so what to capture in terms of those aspects of their relationship with each other for you? Yeah, that kind of banter that they have. And I mean, there's another moment you've reminded me of, which is in uh, in the in the Women's Institute scene at the end of episode six, where he's kind of bombing on stage. But he has this line which uh, Blair saw, and this is, you know, one of the things that ma made me pick up on this, you know, and he goes up. I'm glad we're having a good debate. And you know, he's, he's, he's laughing at himself. He knows he's absolutely dying there, but he laughs at himself. He makes a joke at his own expense. And I find that quite endearing. Um, but yeah, you ask about Cherie. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was amazing to have, I, I've known Lydia for a long time. We left drama school at the same time, not the same drama school, but you know, so I've, I've known her as, as long as I've been acting really. And, um, and to get, uh someone of her kind of caliber um i mean i think she, uh, her performance as sheree kind of sells my performance as blair really because she's so convincing and as you say to have that kind of um uh, chemistry in the sense that they've known each other a long time and can take the piss out of one another and are comfortable with one another is absolutely golden similarly um the three actors who play um, Alistair Campbell, Angie Hunter and Jonathan Powell, um, who really just had to improvise. I mean, they had no scripted lines, but we did a, a few, mo you know, we actually shot several different days, in di di different bits, some of which are in the film, some of which are not. But the main bit that comes to mind is in that episode where they're kind of putting together the dossier about how the monarchy should be modernised. And we just improvised and, you know, Eric just put a camera on us and we just improvised. And But they're also good and so smart and so convincing and had researched their characters so well that it felt very, um, uh, just, it, it felt very convincing. And so you get a lot of value out of that. So, yeah, I think those relationships were, were really important. And and actually, since I mentioned him, Eric Richter-Strand, who directed the the block that I do most of my stuff in, he directed episodes six and nine. <laughs> And my relationship with him, you know, knowing that it's really important in filmmaking that um, the the only thing that the camera is ever going to see is uh, what what the director's looking for. Because I mean, you, you're very lucky if if they catch something that they weren't looking for um, in television, certainly because you know someone's got to put the camera there. They've got to decide to be in a close up because they know something interesting is that deserves a close-up is happening there's i guess there's two ways to do that one is to be the sort of actor who just has absolutely no awareness or interest in what the camera is seeing and just be completely in your performance and they see what they see they don't see what they don't see and then like and you know i've tried to do that sometimes but i'm probably more cut from the cloth of somebody who really does want to communicate and and having a, a, a um the luxury of the ear of a director who, who and getting on the same page so that you're both looking for the same things out of the storytelling was really valuable. I really, really valued that relationship and, and Eric's kind of intelligence about, you know, all these things that we're talking about, you know, I, the, to be able to communicate to him what was interesting to me about Blair so that he would look for it, you know, and or say, I don't think that's, you know, that's, that's all great, but I just don't think that's going to make the cut. Um, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been in experiences uh, earlier in my career or um, different circumstances where, but, you know, the, the closer you are to the top of the call sheet, the easier it is to communicate to the filmmakers what you think you're doing, either by doing it because they're looking at you a lot, because you're on camera a lot, because you're in a lot of scenes, not necessarily by telling you, oh, watch this, I'm going to do this, or, or by doing that. But when you're just a day player or when you're coming in and you're kind of on the back benches, it's much harder to do that. So you can be giving the performance of a lifetime and it doesn't ever reach the audience because the camera's never looking for it. And that can be very frustrating. So it's really important one way or another 
either by just by being so magnetic. But I mean, it, it does tend to come. It's just much easier. The, the more the more lines you've got in a film, the easier it is to be good. Not because the amount of lines you've got, but because the camera just looks at you for longer. So the filmmakers get to know what you're doing and they you start to see, oh, that's not what I imagined, but that's actually really interesting. Let's get more of that. Do you know what I mean? It's a it's a cruel reality. It's the same on stage, isn't it? You know, the more time you're the more time you're in front of the audience, the easier it is to teach them what's interesting about you or, or awful. I mean, I suppose. Yeah. No, that completely makes sense. And and you were mentioning there as well, the, the scene in front of the women's Institute. And what I find so interesting in terms of how you filmed that is the fact that you were filming with about 350 extras to begin with. So you have all of these actors in the room who are there kind of physically slow clapping you and, and responding. And there's the, the the sense of kind of hostility that exists. But then for the close-ups, you were filming <coughs> some later on in a studio where you don't have that energy in the room. You don't have the sound of the response of, of how everybody's responding to his speech. And so well, what you was would you would never have you would never have that to react to when you're looking my way. So because the sound guys wouldn't want that. So I mean this is something in filmmaking in general that I guess people don't realise. When you know you're looking at Tony Blair in a room of 10,000 people, even if they are there on the day because you're going to shoot in their direction, they would never be responding. They'd be miming at best because they want to keep the dialogue clear. So, um, but also the other thing to say about that scene is that it's 350 people does not feel overwhelming when you're in a room that can take 10,000. And they, they're going to be they're shot in a way that with clever, you know, so that you'll shoot a shot with, you know, 300 people in it, but then they'll multiply that on the wide shot. So, it, and, you know, you're seeing it from different angles. They dress the same extras into the different background angles. So I guess what I'm saying is one has to completely imagine the other side of the coin. It's a bit like acting with a tennis ball. And also they're not, you know, they're, they're supporting artists, otherwise known as extras, um, who haven't read the script. And although they're going to hear the scene and, you know, they're all smart people and they, you know, they'll get some direction from the first AD and third AD, and then they're not necessarily responding rhythmically in the way that is right for what you want to do with your performance. So actually it, the actor has to kind of take control of that by going, I'm going to imagine the response and, and, and that way I can deliver the performance as I think it should be. And then the filmmakers will, and you know, they'll then cover the other side of that and they'll knit the two together. Earlier in my career, I didn't realize that. And you respond to what's in the room and it's not necessarily right for the scene. I mean, on, in, but especially like if you, the, the, the way we're all, trained is that you know you kind of want the authenticity of doing it for real and responding to what's really there in the room but it can really fall flat on camera because by the time they shoot the the angle on on the supporting artists they're doing something completely different to what you're responding to so you have to kind of weirdly i think filmmaking is a lot less honest and authentic i as a young actor i thought Oh, film is like the holy grail of naturalistic acting because you're just you, it's you the camera doesn't lie and you just there but actually because you're always shooting things in in segments it's much much more tricksy in a way than acting on stage where the audience sees what's happening in a wide shot and they know that the two actors are either looking into each other's eyes or they aren't because they can see it and they can feel it whereas on camera you know, very, very often you're looking, you, you know, I mean, I can demonstrate with this zoom, like I know the actual camera is there, but your eye line on my screen is there. But if I was doing this and I want, you know, to a camera, even though the actor's where you are, they'd be going, can you just cheat the eye line there so you, you get the feeling of more intimacy? And the actor who's sitting where you is going, like, he's not even looking into my eyes. How can he be? And that's filmmaking. It's It's full of smoke and mirrors and, it's wonderful once you kind of embrace it, but it's strange and um, it's not authentic. <laughs>
Well, I, I love hearing all the intricacies and, and the different details of these pivotal moments and scenes throughout the series. And you did such a great job with your performance and in, in what you thank captured. You. Congratulations. And thank you so much for such a lovely conversation, Bertie. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.